Hello, good evening everyone. It's great to see so many people here today. Welcome to the September meeting of the Madison Astronomical Society. And uh, yeah, it's the uh, end of summer just about already. Time sure flies, but it's great to see so many people back here again uh, after kind of a long, fun summer. So thanks for being here. Um, I'm just going to start out with a few announcements and things. Um, coming up just this week, we're going to have uh, here at UW Space Place, they're going to have their regular series of presentations. Now, uh, Gal, back when we first started going back to personal meetings, you might remember um, uh, Rachel McClure who gave us a presentation. She's going to be back here this Tuesday uh, doing a talk entitled Astronomy from the Milky Way to the Far Beyond, the Modern Gaia James Webb Space Telescope Era. And uh, the synopsis of that talk is, the new observational tools have dramatically expanded the detail and depth available to our astronomers studying galaxy structure and evolution with our, within our galaxy and deep into our universe. The Gaia Satellite Observatory has reached a critical point in its historic mission where the observational certainty and resolution of the location and motion of stars within the, our galaxy can be reliably measured all the way to our galaxy center and out far into the disk. The incoming new observations with the James Webb Space Telescope of galaxies observed at early times early in the evolution of the universe provide a groundbreaking window into early periods of galaxy evolution. So she's going to kind of compare those two approaches to studying galaxies, and it sounds like a really fascinating talk. And that's coming up this Tuesday, September 13th at 7 p.m. right here at UW Space Place. Um, also uh, coming up next month on uh, Friday, October 7th, we're going to be having, hopefully with it, for the first time in a couple of years, our in-person moon over Monona Terrace. And uh, for that, we're, uh, we normally appeal to our, the members in our club for volunteers um, normally, we'd like to have, you know, roughly 15 telescopes up on the roof. So if you have a telescope or a pair of binoculars, um, something like that, um, feel free to contact me and volunteer. Also, if you like parent carrying around a green laser pointer and like pointing out uh, constellations to people, that would be great too. We will also need a couple of people to... Uh, to uh, stay at the information tables and give uh, guests uh, information about the club and the event and other astronomy resources in the area. And also we need a couple of people just to kind of mill around in the crowd and let them know, if, hey, if you go over here, you can see this object through this telescope and this is going on over here. There's, and we'll have the, you know, a couple of guest presentations going on. So, you know, just to with all the things going on, let people know where they can go to find what they want to do. And then, of course, anybody else who wants to join us is welcome. Chris, do you have a question? Uh, we have someone, do we have someone that's going to take that new 8-inch that we have? Because that would be perfect for Moon Over Monona. Yeah, I agree. I'm not going to do it uh, myself, but, yeah, we have a, in the, a new 8-inch uh, uh, Dobsonian telescope that if anyone doesn't feel like uh, hauling around their big, heavy standard uh, behemoth telescope and would like something a little bit easier to manage, just let me know and we'll uh, set you up. Um, does anybody else have any questions about Moon over Monona Terrace? All right, and again, that's coming up on Friday, October uh, 7th, and the event will start at 7 p.m. and go until 9.30 p.m. And there will be a weather call no later than 4 o'clock that day. Um, you're going to... Um, Oh, if you could come up here, do you have an announcement about uh, membership renewals? Just, I'll have you're going to come up here and speak to the microphone. In other words, do I? The answer is yes. Um, the annual membership year runs from uh, October 1st to September 30th of the following year. 
and I'm going to be mailing out the renewals um, uh, by next Thursday. I'll send out an email as soon as they're mailed out. Um, some of you uh, joined late in the year and you're either getting discounted or you're already you're paid for next year. So if you joined late, um, you'll get a discount. The prices have not changed. So 70 for um, regular observing members, uh, $30 if you're not an observing member, $5 if you're a student, 45 if you're an observing student. And by the way, we, we are starting to enforce observing students. There was a little thing in the, in the uh, bylaws that we kind of missed. You have to be 24 or less to get a student membership. In age, yeah, 24 yeah. years old or less. Yes, so you, you can still be a fine wine, but not an old wine. You have to be enrolled in a school. Yeah. And you also have to actually be enrolled in a school, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, yes. Uh, does somebody else have a question? I see some. Oh, get magazine subscriptions. Cheaper. Yes. Okay. Uh, question is one of the, one of the benefits of membership is you can get club mem uh, club discounts for Sky and Telescope and astronomy, and the information for ordering that there's not a code. Uh, you order directly now from the two publishers, and information about how to do that is included in the letter that I send out. Thank you, Jurgen. Oh, I also believe a fellow named Walter had a question he wanted to pose. Walter. Yeah. Um, I wanted to know if there's anyone in the group here or if you know other members in the club that are interested in solar astronomy. I'm uh, getting into it very deeply again and for the first time working with H-alpha uh, imaging, etc. So if you know anybody or you're doing it, see me after the meeting so we can talk about it. And uh, if you're not interested in it, this book, a remarkable book, it's a been translated from the French into English, and it's one of the finest treatises on the solar astronomy as I've ever seen. So you may want to get this. Yeah, it looks like the name of the book is titled Solar Astronomy, Observing, Imaging, and Studying the Sun, and that's by Christian Vel Veladrich. Yeah, he's one of the best uh, solar images in the world. Thank you very much, and yeah, I think there's a lot more interest these days in solar astronomy, and the fellow over there, uh, Waving your hand, waving his hand. That's Bob Hamers. He he's been doing a lot of work with uh, solar observing these days. Oh, and I hear we're entering a new cycle for sunspots. For now is the perfect time to kind of get going in the solar observing. Um, does anybody else have any uh, questions or announcements or information they'd like to share? All right, is there anybody here who's never been at a Madison Astronomical Society meeting before? Oh yes, uh, lots of new people. Do you care to introduce yourself to the club? I'm Bernie Ripp. Um, I actually was trying to get in here, I was gonna try and come on April of 2020 and uh, <laughs> <laughs> finally made it. <laughs> it's great to see you, thanks for um, Thanks for being so perseverant. I don't know if I'm as, inner, as deep into astronomy as everybody else here is, but I'd uh, like to uh, get in here. I actually have some land east of Madison, the hilltop. You can see the Capitol Dome from. I don't know. It's kind of rough to get. You'd have to have four-wheel drive to get up there, but I'm wondering if it would be a good... Uh, it's not a real dark site, but something fairly close. And then also I'd like to connect. I don't know if anybody else is interested in going seeing the... 2024 solar eclipse. Oh, oh yeah. Because <laughs> I went to the last one by myself and and uh, would like to hook up with some other people to share the driving or whatever. Or, uh, All right, okay. yeah. It's a little great to meet and I'm gonna uh, also, yeah, what's your name, sir? Or, or right here. Right. Oh, there we go. Uh, Mike Qual, I've been a member for a year, but I haven't been to a meeting yet. <laughs> nice to meet you, Mike, thanks for being here. Sure. And we also have, oh yes, right here. Yeah, Kevin Shea, I've uh, been a member for two years, uh, only got into astronomy 2.1 years ago, uh, and this is my first meeting. Thanks for being here. It's great to meet you. And, uh, and I know this fellow, Walter, you just uh, brand, one of our brand, most brand new members. I'm Ralph Lyon. Oh, Ralph. Uh, uh, I just want to learn everything I can about it. 
It's great to meet you, Ralph. I guess you're from Mississippi, right? That's correct. Just, just we're, my wife and I are the first Southern couple in history to retire and move up north. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to the Great White North. Oh, you, oh, oh, right over here. Oh, yes, I will come right to you. What's your name? I am Rob Strafer, uh, friends with Gil and Ray, and I've been out shooting once, I think, with Jeff. Um, do some late night photography of all kinds, including some astronomy work. And here's a guest today. It's great to meet you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. And also, before I sign off with the announcements, we have a meeting. Our next meeting is going to be on Friday, October 14th. And our guest presenter is going to be John Rummel. And I was interested to know, John, if you have any details on your presentation. Well, I just, I'll talk about it before I introduce Jeff. All right, perfect. All right. So, do you have a microphone, John? All right, so I'm going to switch off this microphone for a little bit, and you'll hear some quiet, and the next person you'll hear talking is John Rummel. Test, there we go. Um, so, this is my first night back, too, so I'm, I'm thrilled to see many new members here tonight, that's great. Um, so I'm gonna introduce Jeff, that's why I'm up here, but as a preview to next month's talk, I guess that will be October, uh, whatever date our meeting is, I forget right now, but I am going to give a talk. Some of you know that we've been doing a project on uh, compiling the history of this club. Uh, MAS is going to celebrate its 90th anniversary, continuously operating as an astronomy club for 88 years now. It'll be 90 years in a couple of years. And as a prelude to that, I'm going to give a talk on some of the really cool and surprising things we discovered about the history of this club. So that's next month. For this month's talk, one of my oldest MAS friends, Jeff Schockler, um, who I will introduce. You can see the nature of his talk is uh, he's going to talk about computer applications and phone applications that can assist you in observing. But I just wanted to tell one quick story. Um, I've been doing the meeting organization for a while now, <clears throat> about four years ago, give or take. We had um, a meeting uh, speaker planned, and we were all gathered here just like we are right now. Gets to be 7.15, speaker usually shows up, no sign of him. 7.20, 7.25, no speaker. And by 7.30, I was on the phone, I had his number, called him. There had been a scheduling snafu. He had been traveling, and his computer and his phone were set to a distant time zone, and the reminder just never popped up, and he just completely spaced it. He lives in Platteville. He just could not get here for the meeting. So we were stuck. We had no presenter. In steps Jeff Schockler. He happened to have his laptop with him, probably the same laptop he has here. He happened to have a little presentation that he had put together with literally a minute's notice. Jeff stepped to the podium, gave a presentation that night, that many people thought was one of the finer presentations. Jeff is one of our most frequent speakers, and we love to have people from inside the club give talks. So please welcome Jeff Schockler. Earlier. OK, there we go. Excellent. Thank you, John. That was very kind to remind me of that evening. Um, this talk may not be as good as that one, so he set the expectations really high. Um, it's really good to see everybody again. It's been a long time. Uh, been two years for me since I've been physically here at the Space Place for an MAS meeting, so it's really a, a delight to be able to come back and speak to everybody again today. And interestingly, over the course of the pandemic and, and frankly, over the last several months, for many reasons, I haven't been able to do a lot of astronomy. I haven't been able to get out and do astrophotography just a little bit of a week ago, which is the first time in a long time. So when John asked me to talk, I'm like, what in the world am I going to talk about? Because I haven't been doing that much. And I realized that one thing that has been happening um, over the course of the last couple of years is people have been talking about astronomy software and applications. Uh, you know, is it okay to go out to YRS tonight? You know, how's the forecast look? What's the deal with the smoke? All of these kinds of questions. What's going to be up? I haven't been out observing or imaging in two months. What's up there now? 
And I realized that we're living in the golden age of astronomy, not just because we have all these incredible orbiting observatories and new ground-based instruments that are just striking and what they're capable of, but also for the amateur astronomer, we have this incredible array of software, uh, both for desktop applications, browser-based stuff, and even on these things that we call phones, but they're really our portable computers. Um, we've got lots of resources available to make our lives easier, to determine whether or not we want to exert the energy to schlep 250 pounds of gear. Lower a little bit, yep. 250 pounds of gear out to wire us or not. How's that, a little bit better? Go lower or is it good? All right, thank you. Um, so we have all of these options available, and I realize we haven't had a talk in a long time. I remember one, I don't know, maybe six, seven, eight years ago, where uh, we talked a little bit about uh, software for amateur astronomy. I thought now would be a good time to do it again. I've even seen the email, the uh, membership email, the observer's email list light up now and then about, hey, what are you using for forecasting, or what are you using to uh, determine the conditions for astronomy tonight? So I thought I would give a presentation um, about that. So what are we going to be covering tonight? I'm going to cover weather forecasting and planning, a really, really important subject, a little bit of feedback. How's that? A little bit better? Okay. Um, software applications for astronomical conditions for forecasting and planning, so seeing, transparency, that kind of stuff. Um, Observing and imaging planning and information. So what are you going to look at tonight? What are you going to image? If you're going to image that object, what equipment are you going to use? How are you going to frame it? Um, those kinds of questions. Um, observing and imaging resources. You've just been scanning the skies uh, with your beautiful binoculars, and you found an object. You don't know what it is. You, how can you look it up, find out what it is, and find out more information about that object? That kind of thing. Um, planetarium and virtual reality uh, sky tools. This is probably one of the biggest things and really transformational things for me as an observer and an imager is the, the power of these applications, even on our phones, um, for planetarium and virtual reality type things, to be able to really, really dive deep into major data sets to find out what you're going to plan, what you're going to do, understand what it is you're seeing, um, things like that. And then finally, some specialty software and apps. Um, a lot of conversations lately about solar imaging. Aurora, always a big thing in the news. People are like, solar storm, get out there, and there's nothing, right? So it's over and over and over again. So there are some really good apps that will tell you, it's like, don't make the effort unless you can drive north about eight hours and have a good north horizon over a lake, and then you can see some aurora. But here in Madison, it takes special conditions to be able to see aurora. Um, but there are apps that can help you for that. So that's kind of where we're headed tonight to go through some of these categories of software and applications. What we won't be covering, even though I kind of promised it, software applications for astrophotography and image processing. I was starting to build that into this talk when I realized, oh my God, that's its own presentation. I mean, there's just one of those applications I can do an entire presentation on, actually more than one. Um, but the array of applications and software that are out there for free and for purchase to do this is huge. And, uh, and they're good. I mean, it's good stuff, not stuff that's kind of marginal. So I think I'll do another talk uh, another time about this stuff. And Bob Hamer's gave me a good idea that maybe we'll even do a PixInsight workshop, maybe a virtual one, so online we can all be working with our own data sets or something like that um, to kind of introduce people who may not know much about PixInsight, which is something of the gold standard for astro, uh, astrophotography image processing. So sorry for those of you who came. You can get up and go if you need to <laughs> for this part of the promised uh, presentation. I'm going to save that for another time. It's just too much. Another thing about tonight's talk, this is 100% biased, OK? <laughs> This is really a presentation of my favorite applications, the things that I've discovered over the course of many, many years of doing observing as well as doing imaging that I found most useful. They're my go-to apps, my go-to software, my go-to websites to do all these things that we like to do. My own kind of um, 
software landscape is very based in the Apple ecosystem, so there are going to be a lot, a lot of Mac OS and iOS type things that I'll be showing you. But interestingly, um, many of those are cross-platform. So I may be showing you the Mac or iOS version of these. A lot of them are available for Android and PC too. And I will show you when we start getting to the applications, you'll see exactly which ones are cross-platform or browser-based. So, but just fair warning, this is like Jeff's favorite stuff um, tonight. Um, there are some applications, this is particularly relevant for the uh, image processing, the astrophotography processing type stuff or image capture. There are some things that are PC only. We're not gonna actually hit very many of them tonight since I kind of took that out of the talk. Uh, in the next uh, conversation, I will have two computers here because some of these applications for image processing in particular are PC only. Uh, but tonight, I can get away with using my Mac. There are, again, many cross-platform op platform options available. And it's really common now. I, I actually discovered that a number of the apps that I love on my phone, for example, are also browser-based. So I'll be showing a lot of them to you on the browser first because it's just bigger format and easier. And then I'll fire up my phone and show you some of the stuff on the phone too, because they have some other functionality as well. So kind of getting into things, you kind of get used to the format of how I'm presenting these. So the weather forecasting and planning uh, component of kind of astronomical software is really critical, right? You've just finished a hard day's work and you're like, do I or don't I run around to gather all my equipment, shove it in the car, and drive 45 minutes to go to a dark place? Will the moon be up? Will there be too much moon? Uh, will the seeing be horrible if you're interested in planetary or lunar? Um, those kinds of things. The weather bit, will there be clouds? What's the smoke situation? Um, those kinds of questions. The weather bit piece is really important. Any amateur astronomer has to learn how to do a bit of their own forecasting to determine whether or not it's worth your while to actually get out and do this hobby that we all love. So this is the uh, list of kind of the primary resources that I tend to use or go to uh, for just plain old weather forecasting and planning. So this isn't really about seeing, it isn't about transparency, it's not about astronomical conditions. It's really about what's happening meteorologically and what's gonna be happening over the next couple of few days or this weekend uh, when I have time to get out and don't have work the next morning. So I'm gonna start um, with Carrot. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna show you a little background here and fire up my phone. Fire this up. Hopefully it will uh, transition. Oh, I know what I gotta do. This is tricky. The fact that I can even display my phone um, on this screen was something I learned about only uh, about a week ago. So this is the first time I'm trying to do it. There we go, and this is cool. I can actually mirror image my phone on the screen for you. But I wanted to have a pretty background um, for you. So the background is actually another application we're gonna be looking at in just a little while. So you can see I have so many um, applications on my phone. I actually have two setups for astronomy. This is Astronomy 1, these applications. And then I have Astronomy 2. I have so many astronomy applications that I've got all of these. And then I do have a little set of weather applications. And again, these are the ones that I've sifted and winnowed to use the UW-Madison uh, phrasing. Uh, down to, to be my primary things when I'm trying to figure out what am I gonna do weather-wise, or am I gonna do anything based on the weather uh, this coming weekend. So Carrot is a very quirky weather application, but I like it a lot. So it is gonna come up, and here's um, the primary interf interface for Carrot. And like almost all applications these days, you can set multiple locations, favorites. So. Like I commonly have not only my home in Madison, I'll have YRS, I might have Donald Park because we do um, public events at Donald Park. I used to have Baraboo because we used to do some uh, public events at the Baraboo at Devil's Lake. Um, so you can set multiple locations to see what the weather is gonna be like. Or if you're traveling, you can say, hey, I wanna keep an eye on the weather in Greenville, North Carolina, where my parents are. And I've let my telescope out there before. So I wanted to keep an eye on the weather to see if I was gonna be able to use it. 
But um, the funny thing about, one of the funny things about Carrot is that you can set the level of sarcasm you would like the application to have. <laughs> I, I kid you not, okay? You, you actually, it can get really snarky, and you can set maximum snarkiness, which is actually downright rude. Um, so I don't have that set because sometimes I'm in public and when the notifications pop up, it can be really rude if you have it set a maximum of snarkiness. Uh, but normally it's telling you like, you know, ha ha, some rain's coming, you sad person, you, you know, that kind of a thing. So I love that, that just suits my humor. But it's got some really powerful things, particularly its data visualizations are really nice. So this is kind of a normal forecast type of thing. You'd expect to see the temperature range. Um, is it sunny or partly cloudy in the coming hours? <clears throat> Excuse me, from the current time. Uh, what are the next few days going to look like? What are the temperature range? All that, that's normal stuff for any weather app that all of us are probably pretty used to. But one of the cool things is, is when you dig a little deeper into what um, Carrot offers, is that I just clicked on today's information and it gives you this kind of menu of things that you can look at. And one thing that's really important that we often neglect thinking about, particularly if you're an observational astronomer, if you're not doing imaging, wind isn't as big of a deal for you. If you're imaging, it's a big deal. There's a threshold at which, above which, wind-wise and wind-gust-wise, you do not want to go. You don't want to image if the winds for me out at YRS, for example, if they're above about 12 miles an hour, it's really almost not worth me sustained imaging. Uh, gusts, gusts above 12, 14, 10, or 20 miles an hour, that's really not helpful for imaging, right? If you're observing, you can actually do some observing uh, still uh, and manage that depending on the mount type of telescope and what focal length you're, you're observing at. But so the wind capabilities of this are really fun. So if I click wind speed, up pops this data visualization. And you'll see the bottom row is the actual wind speed. The top row are the gusts, okay? This is great because I can set this to YRS and see what are the conditions at YRS going to be like, not necessarily where I'm sitting at here in Madison. So that's a really cool one. And then similarly, you can reverse that and do what are the gusts, right? If that's a concern, and then you see the bottom row becomes the, um, the wind speeds. Uh, another useful one is humidity. So what's the humidity curve look like? Really important when you're thinking about dew point. You know, how dewy is it gonna get? If you don't have active dew protection, this is a big thing, because at some point during the night, if things cool off rapidly and the humidity is high, you're gonna find yourself in trouble and needing to um, blow dry. Here's the actual dew point curve. So it has dew points. And again, you can pick this for your observing location, set it up to be able to plan what are you gonna do. So I really like Carrot because it's got um, these really robust deep dives uh, into the information and data, and there's lots of stuff to explore. So I wanted to introduce you to Carrot, uh, and don't forget you can set the snarkiness in the settings, which is really fun. So I'm um, gonna go back to my presentation. I'm gonna take this back to here, because I'll be going back in in a little bit. Go back here and go from the current slide. So going back to the other weather applications, um, all of us need a good weather radar um, for many, many reasons. Uh, and that is really true for astronomy as well. If you're thinking about whether or not there's precipitation or lightning that might be in the area, something like that, you may have clear conditions, but maybe there's a front approaching uh, and it's approaching fast. That's the kind of thing you'd wanna pay attention to if you're already out in the field, for example. Or let's say you're out at the Nebraska Star Party, right? There are no trees. <laughs> and, you know, is there a major storm approaching that's got a lot of lightning coming? So really one of my go-to um, weather radar apps is My Radar Pro. And you can see that it's all platform. So it is um, iOS, it's Android, it's uh, PC and Mac. I'm going to show it to you on my phone. You have to get out of presentation mode to do this. At least I remembered that this time. I'm gonna go back to the phone. Open it up. And go to My Radar Pro. So we're opening up, and this is current conditions. Uh, here 
in Madison. And you can see it's actually doing a play, right? It's doing the um, scroll through time. Uh, about an hour and a half, two hours worth of data. This is the current time. And you can see Wisconsin and Madison are actually in pretty good shape. But where does our weather come from? Our weather comes from the west, in either the northwest, the west, or the southwest. So we pan out a little bit, and look what's going on, happening up to the northwest. There is clearly a front line. It's actually... Um, you can see it right there, right? That's another setting that you can do in my Radar Pro is show the fronts, which is unusual, actually, in a lot of radar applications. They often won't show that. They'll show uh, weather alerts, uh, but they won't show the fronts. And we have a cold front uh, approaching, and it's actually approaching pretty quick. And if we go ahead and scroll that, oop, we got to scroll it on my phone. There we go. You can see that everything is kind of moving along that front line right now, and that front line is going to sag south, and that's actually what's going to get us tomorrow. Things are going to cool off a little, and we're going to be able to rain starting tomorrow. So my Radar Pro has a lot of capabilities as well. Um, I keep wanting to do that on there, not on the phone, because I'm actually on the phone. Um, forecast, you can do winds. You can display winds, air quality, which also relates to the smoke. Uh, issue. Uh, for those of us, I know we have some pilots in the crowd. There's aviation weather uh, layers that you can add, um, wildfires, things like that. Um, this does have some in-app uh, purchases uh, that you can do to kind of expand the functionality and capabilities of uh, the tool. So I really like uh, my Radar Pro um, for the quick glance, especially. It does show the cloud layers as well as precipitation. Well, it's more of a snapshot of the clouds. I'll show you some other things that will show you more dynamic, real-time uh, cloud situations. Um, and also water vapor, a really important thing, right, for amateur astronomers. How much water vapor uh, is coming my way or is actually overhead? Uh, that might factor into whether or not you go out um, on a given night. So I'm going to go back to, oops, just zoomed in. I'll just go back to here. So other uh, planning resources are a couple of resources out of um, the um, UW-Madison, actually. Um, Real Earth and the GOES viewer, G-O-E-S, which is GOES weather satellites, are two really interesting um, uh, tools that provide you with really, really good uh, deep information um, about clouds, uh, can give you information about smoke, can also give you information about water vapor at high, mid, and low altitudes. So this is really important, right, for, particularly for imagers, but it can also be important uh, if you're an observer, uh, because if you have a lot of water vapor around, you're not going to see those faint fuzzies, those, those galaxies that you're hunting for that are low magnitude. They're going to be just washed out uh, because of light scatter due to, for example, high altitude water vapor. So this is the browser interface. Uh, whoa, what just happened? There we go. I think I dinged the uh, HDMI cable. This is the browser interface for the uh, Real Earth um, viewer. Um, and it's a website. So it's uh, realearth.sscc.wisc.edu. And it's got a lot in there. This is something that just like if you have extra time in your hands, just wander around because there's all sorts of things you can look at. But under um, this menu over here, products and layers, the products is where you want to start. It's like what is the tool or the available data set that you want to look at? And I usually go to GOES East, C-O-N-U-S, which is continental U.S., okay, the eastern continental U.S., I click that one, and an array of resources pops up in the corner. And I'm going to show you one because it's nighttime now. If it was daytime, I'd show you an RGB vis visible image of our cloud, current cloud situation. But I'm going to go over here to um, an infrared uh, view. So I'm going to use the clean infrared view, add that product. And all of a sudden, you see this. This is what the satellite's view is seeing, Okay, the GOES satellite with this particular image pro product. And I'm gonna zoom in on our state. And once I stop moving, you'll see the uh, data will fill in and you'll get the tighter resolution. The, the RGB, the visual uh, imagery is 
really sharp. So the infrared is a little bit more soft and muted, but you can see incredible details in the cloud structures and kind of what's happening and how they're moving um, in the uh, visible light if it's daylight. Um, so that would be a good thing when you're planning, okay, tonight is what, how fast is this front sagging? How much water vapor is ahead of it? Or is it actually gonna be a good opportunity to do some observing for a few hours tonight? Because oftentimes in front of a cold front, you've got fairly stable air and it doesn't have a lot of water vapor in it. So this is a good satellite imagery kind of resource uh, for you. And I'm gonna go back to the products and show you the, um, so here's like mid-level water vapor, high-level water vapor. So here's the high-level water vapor uh, situation. And look at that, ahead of the front, there is some high-level water vapor, okay? So let's say you were thinking of going out to see if you can sneak a couple hours. It's like, eh, it may not be worth your while, depends on what you're doing. So the GOES resource in the Real Viewer um, browser application, or um, there's a phone version as well. So you can literally be out on site if you have cell reception. You could be looking at these data to see, uh-oh, you know, I only, I only have two and a half hours before things start getting really bad. Uh, and I should be packing up or something like that. So the real viewer is, a uh, real earth, excuse me, uh, viewer is a really, really nice resource. Uh, another resource, uh, the next on my list, is the GOES image viewer. And it's really working with the same products. It's just presenting it in different ways. So kind of whatever works for you and what you like. Uh, definitely, again, you wanna pick your products. And here you start with the regions. And if you hover over, it'll kind of show you where it is you're looking. I'm gonna go back down to, where is it? Do, 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 continental US goes east, continental US. So I'm gonna click that and here are all those products and it also gives you a little bit of a glimpse of what they are and describes them a little bit for you. Um, let me find the infrared cloud tops, it, especially if you're a weatherhead. If you, if you like meteorology, you can spend endless hours playing with these things. They're really amazing. Um, just for grins, let's do, there's the long wave. I like there's a dirty long wave IR. It's like, ooh, it's dirty, what's with that? And it's kind of like carrot, you know, it's a dirty thing. Clean long wave IR. So we're gonna go up here to Wisconsin and look at what's going on in Wisconsin. You can see what's coming to us uh, with that front frontal boundary. And you can already see it starting to sag and know that it's gonna be coming across us um, pretty quickly. So these products, um, there are smoke ones, but I'm gonna show you a different resource that I think is kind of the best for smoke, uh, given that that's really become a part of our lives with all the terrible fires that happened both in Canada and in the Western US these days. Um, during the day, again, the RGB uh, or the red filter, the blue filter visual products are really, really powerful um, tools to kind of get a look at what's coming your way um, in, uh, in the atmosphere. So um, just a heads up, this is not on my list on the slides, but I wanna let you know. So the SSCC is the Space Science and Engineering Center at UW-Madison. They're the ones who are responsible for these image viewers and the data, getting the data off the satellites and processing them and presenting them for public use. They also have a local weather uh, page that you can go to and explore and get lots of useful information about essentially what's happening here in and around Madison. So I just wanted to call your attention to that resource as well uh, as a good way to do some weather forecasting and planning. Um, let's go back here. And then this last one uh, for weather forecasting and planning also will come into play with astronomical kind of planning in terms of what are the conditions gonna be like for astronomy, not just weather-wise, is skippysky.com. And you're like, oh my God, what is skippysky.com? By the way, it's skippysky.com.au. It's an Australian uh, guy named Andrew who I've been in communication with because when I was preparing this presentation, I went to Skippy Sky because I like using it and I use it all the time. And it hadn't updated. North America and Europe had not updated in about a week and a half. And I emailed him, I said, there's a contact thing. I contacted him, I said, hey, just wanna let you know, hello from Wisconsin, let you know that North America and Europe had not been updating since August 30th. I'm pretty sure you're aware of this, but just want you to know. 
he wrote me back, hi Jeff, thanks for letting me know. I check Australia all the time, make sure it's running, and who knows what's gonna break. Didn't realize it just rebooted Australia and North America, or Europe and North America for you, you should be good to go. So now I'm in touch with him, and he and I have been exchanging emails. He's a really nice guy, and lives way out in the bush in Australia, and has really dark skies. He sent me some photos. Oh my God, he lives in like probably Bortal 1. It's really, really nice. Um, but Skippy Sky is awesome. I'm going to show you the browser version. Again, it's, um, it's actually only browser-based, so there isn't an app or anything like that. Um, this is the compact view of what Skippy Sky offers. So if you go to the main website, there is this is the Northern Continental US button, and the compact view actually shows you some weather stuff, clouds. It shows you... Um, seeing, it shows you transparency, and it also shows you um, do risk, okay? And it's a time interval, so I'm gonna zoom in over here for you. And it's in UTC, so you wanna subtract five hours uh, to get to, to our time. So this is Wisconsin, and look, see that weather boundary, right, that we've been looking at in the satellite imagery and in the radar? But let's go forward in time. What I usually do is I try and find uh, th 3 UTC the next day, because what's that? That's 10 p.m. here. That's prime observing time, right? It's after astronomical twilight. You're like, if you're imaging, this is when your, your sweet spot is. You're going, you're imaging, you're not too tired. What does it look like tonight at 10 p.m.? Looks like crap. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's like, nope, don't want to be at YRS at 10 p.m. tonight because it ain't happening. Skippy Sky is remarkably accurate. He's actually drawing on data sets that are based out of the climate group in Colorado. Um, so he's just doing massive data downloads, but he's done these data visualizations that are really, really helpful for astronomers and other people. And I'll be showing you the other resources, the transparency and the uh, seeing stuff in Skippy Sky as well. But you can see it goes forward in time as well. So this is 6 UTC tomorrow, which would be 1 a.m. Uh, tonight or tomorrow morning. And you can see the situation in Wisconsin is not much better. But this is a really, really good tool. Um, I found it to be very accurate, like really accurate uh, and helpful. And if you go to the, um, uh, where is it? The uh, traditional view, it shows you the uh, cloud uh, information. You can zoom in uh, really tight. Oop, I got it. I didn't pick the correct location. North Central U.S. There we go. Here we are back in Wisconsin. And you can get in pretty tight. So, I, yeah, go ahead. Can you also do historical? Can you go backwards in time? I have not tried that. I mean, I suppose you could archive it. Uh, but I think he's, he's always kind of presenting this window of time going forward. Uh, in his data. Um, so really, really cool resource. I forget even how I stumbled on it, but I'm glad I did. Um, all right, so those are the weather things. Any questions or concerns? Anything coming up from online? I don't know if we have anyone online. Okay. Okay. Yeah, if there are any questions, feel free to interrupt me, raise your hand, whatever you'd like or if you have um, a follow-on, something like that. So now, astronomical conditions, forecasting and for forecasting and planning. So this is more about, okay, the weather suggests it's gonna be decent tonight. Um, these tools can also confirm that, uh, but they're really built for astronomy for the most part uh, to help us understand what are the lunar conditions gonna be, how much moon am I gonna be dealing with, when am I gonna be dealing with it, uh, seeing, transparency, smoke, all these things that we care about for our imaging and for our observing. So Astrospheric is actually um, one of the, the coolest tools that has emerged and really one of the best ones, I think, for, for doing the conditions kind of uh, thinking and work. It is also application-based, uh, multi-platform, I think all platform, uh, and browser-based, so let me refresh it so we get to the current time. So if we all run outside right now, it's beautiful. Yeah, I don't know if you noticed when you, when you drove in. It's like, gosh, it's nice. But look what's gonna happen to us. <laughs> so, 
Yeah, this, 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 this row right here, okay, so here's time, day and time. This row is cloud cover. The darker blue it is, the better, okay? This row is transparency, and this row is seeing. And you can see for the next, oh, I don't know, two and a quarter hours, we're okay, and then it all goes to hell. And that is a real common sight lately here in southern Wisconsin, right? Just a solid wall of white. It means we got nothing that's gonna be totally cloudy and probably precipitating as well. But even with the cloud cover, you can see what's the moon doing? When's the ISS gonna be up? What's the sun doing? So sunrise, sunset. Uh, down here is wind direction and kind of an indication of wind speed. The darker, the slower the winds. So the better, right? Darker is better. Uh, lighter colors, higher the winds. And you can also see the wind direction, uh, which is, again, handy, particularly if you're imaging. Um, down here, temperature and dew point. Okay, really, really important. When they intersect or when they get close, you're gonna get wet and your equipment's gonna get wet, right? So this is all really important to be thinking about when you're planning to go out. Um, there's also kind of an extended forecast that doesn't give the granular details because it's really too far out to even be thinking about that. But it does give you a sense of whether or not anything is looking reasonable, you know, on the order of seven days out. And for us, it's not looking good. <laughs> it's really not looking great. It also gives you some nice kind of moon details, forecast details, things like that. Now I'm going to flip back to my phone and show you the, the astrospheric app on my phone because it does have a, a kind of pro versions or in-app purchase that you can do, which I did for very good reason, and I'm going to show you why. Um, very nominal costs as well. So if I go to Astrospheric, um, free for the base level stuff in, on the app, which has a ton of functionality, and all of $3 a month for this pro functionality, which you might want, and I'll show you why. So let's go to the phone. Um, I'm going to go back to the pretty background because it's a little easier to see the phone with that background. There we go. And I'm going to fire my phone up and go to Astrospheric. All right, look familiar? Right, so once you get used to that user interface, it's actually really easy and really fast to interpret. But notice something different here. So here are the dark, nice dark colors from where we are now to where we're headed at midnight and all that stuff. Notice these little bars down here. In, in this case, there's only one, but then all of a sudden there are two bars and they differ from the main colors here. What I bought for $3 a month is two more climate models, two more weather models. And you can see when they agree, which is like right now, Right? If we walk outside, everything's lovely. All these, all three weather models agree. It's lovely. Look what starts happening. One of them is getting pessimistic earlier than the other two. And then this one, when you get here, the main one is pessimistic, but the other two are saying, eh, not quite so bad. So suddenly you have even more, um, uh, what's the word, analysis paralysis that you can get into <laughs> because you have three weather models one of them is definitely more optimistic than another one. One of them is more pessimistic. The other is kind of middle of the road. But it's really obvious when they all align or when they're generally in agreement and you're like, okay, this is gold. This is time to pack it up and get a YRS. The interesting thing is the more pessimistic model, I think, is the one under the hood of Clear Outside, which is another app I'm going to show you for astronomical kind of forecasting and conditions predicting because it's almost always the most pessimistic, but I've also found it to be the most accurate. So our pessimistic model in, in um, uh, astrospheric and the model that's under the hood of clear outside, which are almost all, those two are almost always aligned, tends to be the most accurate on like an hourly basis for what the conditions are gonna be like here uh, at YRS. Another couple of things that this has, let me see if I scroll, i to go to my phone to scroll. Ah, there we go. See these bars? They are in the transparency column. Guess what those are? Smoke. So at a glance, 
you can see if the smoke is going to be really bad. And we, I will show you how bad it is right now, and it's going to be bad. But that is also worth the price of admission for this little upgrade to Astrospheric, is to have the smoke in these kind of at-a-glance data visualizations. I really like that capability. But let me show you the other super awesome thing. Notice up here, there's a Layers button. And you can see, like right now, we're showing the clouds, right? Remember the clouds that are coming from the, oops, I'm trying to do this again. The clouds that are coming from the um, northwest, you can see them, right? I'm going to change the layer to smoke. Look what's happening. Look what's coming with the clouds, right? It's behind the front. But when that front passes, we're toast, smoke-wise, because it is bad. Look at this. Yeah. But this is on my phone, and you can have it wherever you are, or if you're out in the field, and you can understand why is my transparency degrading when it's supposed to be cloudless and low water vapor. It's because a bunch of smoke is starting to roll over you. And you can also go forward in time um, and see what's it going to look like almost a day and a half out. So it's, it's really got a really good forecast capability, too. So for us, it looks like the smoke is going to start attenuating kind of, um, when is that, Sunday, around 1300. So, so really powerful. Um, I can close this, go back to layers. You can, do cloud you can do transparency, seeing the jet stream. So this shows you where the jet stream is, which obviously is aligning with that front that's coming through really, really powerful tool to have on your phone, of all things, not to mention also on your browser. So Astrospheric is a really remarkable resource for astronomy. Uh, I encourage you to, I mean, it's free. The base functionality, the smoke you get for free, which you don't get is the other models and the smoke in that data visualization. And there's some other little bells and whistles that you get if you pay the $3 a month. Uh, but again, $3 a month is a pretty nominal price for that kind of functionality. So clear outside, um, I'm going to show you on the browser because it's just a little easier uh, to work with. Yep. So clear outside, I'm going to refresh it, get us to current data. So clear outside is another kind of astronomy built, um, or built for astronomy uh, planning tool. Uh, funny thing about uh, clear outside, you can change the setting, but the default when you first get it is to the home of the people who developed uh, Clear Outside. And they live in Devon, England. Devon, England is the cloudiest place on Earth. <laughs> For a long time, I didn't know how to change what, what the default was. So I would always see what those poor guys who built this great resource were dealing with in Devon, England. And every once in a while, they had a clear night. And I was like dancing. I was like, yes, I hope you guys get you know, some really nice uh, imaging or whatever it is they're doing out there. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. How do you get it to change the um, <laughs> So on the browser, it's easy. On the phone, I'll have to show you because I've done that once. You have it on the browser. Yeah, there's, a, there's, it's not hard to set that. Uh, I think it, up to I, it does. Although again, these are the people who built that, so it's almost okay for us to send a little bit of love and emotion toward those poor, <laughs> poor souls. They are never, almost never, seeing any stars. It's way worse than southern Wisconsin, which is saying something. So you'll, you'll probably, from Astrospheric, get a sense of the same kind of data visualization we're dealing with. In this case, total clouds, low clouds, medium clouds, and high clouds. Darker is better, lighter is worse, and more clouds thicker, essentially. Here's when ISS passes are going to happen, uh, in, which is really nice in our area to be able to see that and predict it. Um, you have visibility, uh, precipitation chances. This is a really handy thing of clear outside is the weather, or not the weather, the wind. It gives you the wind speed and direction. And also the color coding. Um, I don't know how accessible it is in terms of if you have color blindness. So color coding is good and bad, right? If you're color blind, color coding does not help you. Um, but you at least have the number and you have the wind arrow to be able to work with. But if you're not, don't have color blindness issues, um, you know, yellow or orange means, hey, um, this is getting a little bit high for normal astronomical purposes. Uh, temperature conditions, you can see green better, cooler. Um, 
Dew point, another thing that gives you dew point information. So really, really critical, especially if you don't have active dew control, you need to keep your eye on that dew point and the temperature and make sure that they're not coming close together. Otherwise, you, you really are gonna have to cover your equipment to protect it. Um, a little bit of information about lunar conditions. So you get percent um, of uh, illumination and also what does that mean for, for observing and imaging? Well, unless you're looking at the moon, more moon is not good, so that's red. Uh, and then you're getting into a situation where is the moon up, is the moon down? It's not up yet, so you got green, but then it starts coming up. Um, so you've got some information there. And again, the, the um, phone app, very, very similar, um, a little bit more compact, but it presents this information in an at-a-glance way to really be able to, to do your planning. Yep, go ahead. You can change that. Yep, you can change that on the browser and you can change it on the phone. Yep. Okay, how about, I've always wondered what the um, wind speeds are, the miles per hour? Yeah, on the phone, per second. in the settings you can change that. So you can have it set whatever you want. Because um, my camera um, has centigrade, right, for its cooling, and um, my active dew controller is in centigrade, I tend to have things set to centigrade just so that I can think in similar units and not have to do conversions and stuff like that. But the phone apps in, in particular, all of them allow you to set what units you want, uh, which is really handy. Great question. Um, so um, I do want to mention, oops, I just went past it, um, the good old uh, clear sky clock, which was a go-to for a long time. It was actually the first, one of the first one of these things that kind of told us is it going to be clear tonight? What are this, the astronomy conditions going to be like? And Clear Sky Clock over the years, um, I still have it. I still have it on my phone. Um, clear outside, do I not have it? I thought I had it queued up. Yeah. yeah, here it is. So Clear Sky Clock is probably familiar to a lot of us. I found over the years it was getting less and less accurate. Um, clear outside, way better accuracy in terms of I'm standing at YRS, what is it saying the conditions are like? And clear, clear sky clock was like wrong a lot, and clear outside was accurate to the hour of what was happening or what was going to happen. Uh, same thing with astrospheric, really, really accurate. So clear sky clock is still available, still a resource. I, I keep it around because I do use it as a planning tool, but I cross-check it with the other ones, and it's the one that tends to be off the most for me. I love it because it was the first and it was the only thing we had for a very long time. But some of these other tools are, are, that are out there are really powerful, really accurate. And some of them like Astrospheric, if you throw the $3 in a month, it gives you multiple models to think about. Uh, was that a question or are you just stretching? Okay, always on the lookout for a question. So anything coming in online? Okay. I hope um, everyone online who can hear me, you have permission to ask questions in chat. Please ask questions. If you do have something, I'll, I'll try and address it. Yeah, go ahead. I've seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of observatories, amateur, yeah. uh, amateur observatories have clear sky chart yeah. on their web. Yeah. Are any of the other apps, are you able to uh, put up so. on your I don't think so. I think that might be a unique capability of Clear Sky Clock, which is cool. It's nice yeah. to be able to provide others that say, hey, these are kind of broadly the conditions at my observatory or this location, or YRS. This is the YRS location, as an example. Um, I don't think, I've never seen anything to indicate that the other ones have that. Although, interestingly, the other apps that I've showed you so far, I mainly use on my phone. Um, so it could be the browser-based might have a path to do that, which is a really good question, something to explore. And then finally, on the forecasting and planning, skippysky.com. I want to go back to that real quick. And go back to, um, going to go back to the main site. The compact view is the one that I tend to use on my phone as well as on the browser for north central US. And here in the middle, is uh, seeing and transparency, okay? With the same level of detail that you got for the cloud cover. So you can see our seeing, uh, once the clouds pass, is gonna go down. 
<laughs> or transparency similarly is going to get cut in half um, very, very shortly. You can see it's very close now uh, to us. And then you go forward in time. Where is my favorite time mark? 3 UTC tomorrow, which is 10 p.m. tonight. And you can see it's just pretty much on top of us uh, and everything's just going downhill. Uh, but you can look further out and see will there be a hole, is there gonna be a gap between systems, things like that. And then the final is the dew point. Like if you're looking at orange or red, you're gonna have doing. Um, so take that into account in your planning. So again, Skippy Sky has some really, really cool tools uh, for that planning uh, of your evening or, or um, your observing campaign. All right. Um, so observing, imaging, planning, and information. What are some of the tools that you can use or get these days? And a lot of these are phone-based. You can see uh, Lunasol Cal I'm going to show you is all platforms, including um, you know, browser-based Mac and PC as well as both phone types, uh, moon phase, gas giants. So this is like, what is happening? What moon is that on Jupiter that I'm looking at it through my telescope? Um, when is astronomical twilight tonight or tomorrow or the following night or next week? Really important thing to know, particularly if you're imaging. Uh, and then our planetarium um, applications like Sky Safari Pro and Stellarium also have these capabilities uh, within them to provide you information about what is it you're seeing? What is it you're looking at? What's going to be happening uh, in the next couple of hours if I'm looking at Jupiter as an example? So let's go to um, the phone to look at Lunasol Cal. I'm going to bring my background back up. Bring the phone back and go here. So Lunasol Cal provides you with a lot of juicy information if you're uh, into astronomy. When sunrise, when sunset, how long's your day? At what's the rate of change? We're getting uh, less light, which we're like, yay, less light. Uh, negative two minutes and 50 seconds per day currently. When's moonset, moonrise, how much illuminated is it gonna be? But if you go to the um, next page, you get all sorts of very useful um, little bits of information. So for us, I don't know about you, I don't do much astronomy in the morning. Um, <laughs> like, I, I think I photographed the um, uh, waning moon once. Normally I'm doing the waxing moon. But astronomical twilight, moonrise, once the blue hours start, when's astronomical twilight? When is it as dark as it is actually going to get where I am? really important number. That's usually an hour and 15 minutes to an hour and a half after sunset, which is brutal in the summer, right? When our sunset is really late, 8.30, astronomical twilight's at 10, which is horrible um, if you have to work tomorrow, the next day. Um, when's full moon, nautical twilight, all that good stuff. There's also specific information about the sun that you can look at, lots of information including the ups and downs and like where is it going up, where is it going down, how high is it getting. You can look at that across days and when are the solstice and equinox events. The moon, similar array of information. Lots of information about the moon conditions and you can change what day you're looking at down here. You go forward in time. So if you're planning, hey, next weekend's looking good based on all these other apps. What's the moon going to be doing? If you're interested in observing the moon, you can get really useful information there. Also, when is it up? When is it down? Where is it up? Where is it down? And again, uh, detailed information, including distance stuff, things like that. I use the distance information when I take pictures of the moon and then want to post them in social media. So I can tell people the moon was 235,246 miles away that night when I took this picture. People like that. They find it interesting. Yep. Um, on the altitude, and, or the azimuth and in, uh, in the and azimuth of the moon. I, mean, I can see how you can project it via the numbers, but maybe do they have some kind of graphical interface that shows they do, the moon they do. coming up higher in altitude? So like now it's so low, it's yeah. Hard to um, where is that? It's really funny because I had not known that was there until I was planning for this talk. Um, here it is. Look at that. So there's the sun 
Uh, and if I go to here, there's the lunar information. And that's YRS. I picked the location as YRS. So moon set, moon rise, um, the altitude. So there is kind of a map capability as well, although it's fairly rudimentary. It's not giving you great stuff. There are some other tools. PhotoPills is one John I think you use a lot that has some really uh, powerful capabilities. Has something along these lines too. Yeah. So, but this is here, and I really didn't know it until I was playing around this with this. Like, what am I going to show everybody? That's there, um, and it was hidden uh, away from me. You click right next to the location, this gets you the map information. So Lunasol Cal, really, really neat resource. Again, browser-based, but also uh, for your phones. Um, let's see. Moon phase is the next one, so I want to show you moon phase. I love this one, you know, moon over moon and Terrace is skipping up. Unfortunately, it'll almost be full. Um, but if we look at the phase tonight, it is almost full or full moon. So moon phase, I'm going to go back to a more interesting point in time. So here we are, um, 8.5 day old waxing moon. Um, it shows you the next time it'll be at that phase. In this case, it'll be October 3rd. And then if you click it, it gives you this. Yeah, so at public events, when I don't know what in the heck that crater is, I fire this up and I tell them what the crater is. It's really, really handy, and I'll show them too. And it also gives you the uh, Apollo, see the Apollo uh, landing site? Gives you those, gives you rills, gives you craters, gives you ghost craters. Um, it's a really, and it, it's not super detailed. There are other tools I'll show you that will go to like the smallest crater. But this is great for that really at a glance major features and topography of the names and things. Yeah. Um, that one actually, I think, uh, moon phase is three bucks, but a flat fee. Yeah. And um, I still use it as my go-to. Per month? No, 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 three bucks, just oh, okay. three dollars. Okay. Yeah. A lot of, of phone-based apps are, if they're not like super powerful, like Sky Safari Pro, are on, if they cost anything, are on the order of two, three, four dollars. They're like, and that's a one-time fee, no in-app cost. Uh, yeah, zoom in like, uh, oop, let me go back. I realize I changed this. How do I zoom in here? Yeah. Oh, just on, on my phone, I'm doing the, the classic pinch. Oh. Yep, so I'm, I'm showing on the phone here. Yeah. I love, I love this app, uh, particularly for public events and stuff. It's just so handy. And frankly, for myself, it's like, I don't know what that crater is. What is that crater? Um, yeah. Uh-huh. Do you have a, a source for the domes on the moon also? The domes? Yeah. This does show some of the domes, not all of the domes, because okay. I know that there are like a couple hundred, I think. Um, but it does definitely, when the appropriate phase, if it's illuminated, it will indicate uh, that there's a dome, uh, which is really cool. Um, Gas Giants um, is another tool. Uh, let me get my, my pretty background, because it's just too busy with the other thing. There we go. Gas Giants, similar thing to this moon. It's like, what is this is what Jupiter looks like right now. So if I zoom out a little bit, see the moons? And look what you can do. Change time. Oh, Ganymede went behind, right? Here comes Europa. Oh, look, there's a shadow. Europa is actually eclipsing. So you can predict when those are going to happen, if it's going to happen when you're observing that night. So it's a really powerful tool, and it also shows you, the if you zoom in, you know, the major cloud features and structures, and you can see, like, when's the red spot going to be coming around the corner or going around the corner? Um, really, really nice tool. And sure enough, it does the same um, for Saturn. Pretty cool, huh? It's also great to show, again, at public events. We're going to have Jupiter and Saturn to play with at Moon Over Monona Terrace. Yeah, here again. Uh, Jeff, I'm curious. What uh, iPhone do you have? What model do you uh, have? 10, the X. 10. So it's an old one. And that's, is that, what, 5 point something or 6 inch? Screen, you know? uh, it's the kind of normal format, not the big one. Okay. Yeah. It's, so it's the normal so, size. I so it doesn't take a huge screen in order to show things. No, not at all. Okay. No, no. To Good make, question. To 
show things legibly. Yeah, to show things legibly. Uh, and then you can also have um, Uranus and Neptune as well. For those of you that have large telescopes, um, you can look at it like that. And you can change to mirror, um, uh, inverted or mirror view as well. So if you're looking through the uh, eyepiece and you know that your telescope shows things inverted, you can invert this so you can see what you're seeing in the eyepiece. So it's just a really neat little resource that does what it does really well. All right. So um, Sky Safari Pro, which I already have fired up, is a planetarium. Um, it's even hard to call it that. It's, it's an incredible astronomy resource is what it is. Um, Sky Safari Pro costs a lot of money. The current version, version 7, if you don't get it on sale, is 50 bucks. When I bought... Uh, five and I had six and I just got seven, got those on sale, they were like $35, so it's gone up. Worth every penny if you're an amateur astronomer. Absolutely worth every penny. And the in-app purchases worth every penny. The best 50 bucks or 70 bucks if you do the in-app purchases, you can drop. Because you have on your phone, in the field, a resource that shows you seven million objects, okay? And you can augment that uh, with uh, other data sets and databases with the in-app purchases. Gives you all the details. You can control your telescope with this thing. You can plan your imaging sessions with this thing. Um, it's, it's ridiculously powerful, but also intuitive and easy to use. Um, because there are so many things you can set and fiddle, you want to take your time with it to kind of get used to it, particularly on the phone, because again, small screen, right? So it's a little bit a little trickier, but again, the user interface is really, really good. So if we go, I think I'm showing current time. Yep, now, use current time. And you can see the moon is up over the horizon. I'm going to change the time. I've got increments in hours. And move forward to uh, 10, about 10.30 tonight. There's Jupiter. And I have this set up to show the ecliptic, so you can see where the planets are going to be coming, and to show the meridian and zenith. So where's, the, where's Zenith? What's at Zenith? And you can see Cygnus is sitting right on Zenith at 10.30 tonight. But remember I said there are apps that can get you more information about the moon. Well, Sky Safari is certainly one of them. So I'm going to center it and zoom in. There's the moon. Now I can go to the solar system controls and say, um, give me the surface labels. Uh-huh. And guess how far you can zoom in? ridiculously far, okay, to find that teeny tiny little thing that you're looking at and want to understand. Your domes? Absolutely. So Sky Safari, and you can do this with the planets, with Mars. You know, you're looking at Mars. What feature am I looking at? Well, you can find out using Sky Safari. Yeah, Terry. Um, the Sky Safari is, you know, for a com on a computer. Yep. It's only on the map. It's not on the I thought it was also Windows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, I think it's all platform. Yeah, 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 which is great. You know, it, it should be because it, it is, to me, it's the Cadillac. I used to be a um, Starry Night person. I used to really like Starry Night. When Sky Safari came out, I just it jumped immediately. It's just so powerful and so good. And I'll show you, it, it has a lot of other capabilities besides this kind of um, uh, planning component to it. Uh, as well, in terms of like what, what's coming, when is it coming, when is it going to be optimally positioned for viewing or for imaging. Um, Sky Safari can do all of that for you. Also, incredibly robust um, search capability up here. You can search, obviously, if you have catalog numbers and stuff, but it has a lot of the vernacular names. So the Iris Nebula I just imaged a week ago, it's taken me to that. So at 10.30 tonight, that's where the Iris Nebula is going to be. And we can zoom in on it. And it actually has images of a lot of the, main, the primary objects as well to give you a sense, again, for orientation. What are you looking at if you're at the eyepiece? And you can mirror reverse and invert this as well if you want to use it as a tool when you're sitting at the eyepiece. So Sky Safari is a remarkable resource. I'll show you some of its other capabilities in just a sec. Oh, Stellarium, I want to mention Stellarium. I'm not a Stellarium user anymore because I'm a Sky Safari Pro user. Stellarium is free, okay? And it's all platform. 
and it's very powerful, and it's great if you're just getting into astronomy because it doesn't overload you <laughs> with information and things you can set and things like that. So Stellarium is browser-based as well as Mac, PC, iOS, and Android. It's great. It's really powerful. Anytime I meet someone who's like, I'm just getting into astronomy, what would be a good app to get Stellarium? <laughs> Free, powerful, easy to use, intuitive, just great. So I'm not going to demonstrate Stellarium because I actually don't have it on any of my gear, but I want you to look it up if you've never seen it before. Uh, or if you have kids, great tool for kids to just, for them to explore the universe with. Stellarium is beautiful and it's free. So look that one up uh, if you haven't seen it before. Um, let's see, let me sell Cal. My time is up. All right, let me make sure I'm in the right place, yep. Okay, a couple of observing or imaging resources. Two things I want to show you really quick. Um, go back to my background, hide that, show you the phone again. So one is called time, and it's just that. So when I go out to do imaging, I have a go-to mount, and I have to tell that mount what time is it, what day is it. Um, latitude and longitude, I also have to tell it, among other things. Time, if you, again, if you have signals, and I do have signal at a YRS, not everybody does, but I do have signal. Time um, is something that will uh, calibrate to a whole bunch of servers that manage time for a whole bunch of really important industries, including the government. And um, the green indicates that the latency is very, very small. Um, so what you have is, this is the time, 2031.09.10, and so forth. This is what I plug into my uh, mount when I'm setting the time. And it also gives me the date, the fact that it's central daylight. In the upper right-hand corner, you actually see the average latency from the servers that it's talking to. And if that latency is low enough, and again, with a mount, especially my mount, which is darn near 10 years old and, and sounds like a... Uh, acts being ground when it's moving, um, the latency isn't all that important. You know, this is accurate, by far accurate enough to, to do a really good mount configuration uh, when you're going. So time, if you need to know the time or want to document the time of when you see an, an object or an observation or you're doing occ occultation work, this app is really, really handy. It's really cool. Um, and this is all it does. This is what that app does. Another app that I like a lot that's just a resource, again, because I will often post my astrophotos on um, social media platforms, Facebook and things, <clears throat> it's part of the outreach, my outreach, approach to outreach. I like to tell people how far away is an object. And sometimes the only way I can get that out of Sky Safari is in kilometers. And what if I want to convert that to miles? Um, like, how far away is the moon tonight when I took that photo? There's this cool little app um, called Amount that does those conversions for you. And there's a new version of it out called Amount Plus. And if you enter, I'm going to go to Amount because I'm more familiar with that one. You enter the number, let's say 50. Let's say I was thinking of kilometers. How many miles is 50 kilometers exactly? You hit this little button. You select what category of units, in this case length, distance. You say, I have the value in kilometers. Whoa. I have the value. I have the value. I wonder if my battery just croaked. No? Battery's still going. All right. Um, I set it to kilometers. All the other units here are the conversions from 50 kilometers. So you can see 50 kilometers is... Um, 0. 0.00000278 light minutes, just as an example. But I'm interested in how many miles is that? It's 31.069. So it's an incredible, powerful conversion tool uh, for any unit you can think of into any other kind of unit, as long as it's in the same category. So I really like um, Amount, and Amount Plus is really cool. I'm just exploring it. Encourage you to get that one for astronomical information and sharing information with others as well. 
And finally, the planetarium and VR sky tools. And I want to go back to Sky Safari to show you a couple of its other capabilities that I leverage all the time. So remember I mentioned that I was imaging the Iris Nebula a week, week and a half ago. Um, I had never imaged the Iris Nebula with my CCD camera. I had shot it before with a DSLR. So I didn't know whether or not I could even fit the Iris Nebula into the frame of my CCD, because I had never imaged it with it before. Well, uh, Sky Safari has an incredible capability, um, which is really, really cool. Um, let me bring it up. I'm used to doing this much more on my um, phone now. Under scope display, I have set up, there's a selection over here that says equipment. You can set up what your gear is in here, what telescopes you have, what eyepieces you have, what cameras you have, what lens you have, everything. And then you can, in scope display, bring that back, you can select the combinations of equipment that you want to use or thinking of using or planning of using. You can see I have a lot of combinations, a lot of options here. But I'm going to pick my standard, my 130 millimeter refractor with my CCD camera, my Astral 8300. And look what that just did. That is the field of view of that combination of equipment. So I was able to look and say, yep, our Nebula will fit. Well, guess what? You can also plan the rotation, the orientation of the frame that you want to frame the object the way you want to in the sky and therefore in the, in the resulting image. And cool thing, last time I shot this object was with my uh, Canon 5D Mark II, which happens to be right here. You can overlay multiple fields of view. So that's what my Canon 5D had when I shot it five years ago, but that was what I shot a week ago, and I actually oriented it about like that. I never center an object ever <laughs> when I'm imaging it. It's just my aesthetic. So it has incredibly powerful planning tools built into it where you the tailor to your own equipment and gear. Yes? How about the ability, if there is any, to take that square and like I have to do to mosaic a large field? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, how to... I'm not sure how, how exactly you would... Yeah, there are other tools for that that I would cover. I do, have, do not use those tools because my computer's on my camera when I'm actually imaging, but there's some very powerful tools. Some of them are free that will, will plan and or control your gear to do that kind of mosaicing. Exactly, yeah, based on your gear and its field of view, exactly. So again, the golden age of astronomy in terms of software for us, because there are all these incredible tools that take the pain out of doing that of, you know, okay, I got to make sure I have a 30% overlap between my frames. I just got to eyeball it, you know, the old way of doing a mosaic. The way that you can do it now, it can actually be almost entirely automated if you wanted it to. And sometimes with a free application, not to mention ones that are cost a couple hundred bucks. Say a 15 millimeter lens on a, on a, on a full yeah, camera. absolutely. Yeah, so like some of the equipment, the combinations that I have in here um, are my uh, wide field. So here's my 17 to 40 uh, f4 Canon lens, um, just sitting on them. On and that's a really wide field, right? So on Sky Safari, you see this 40 degree wide frame, and it's like, oh my god, that's the one I, I'm not used to shooting that wide, but that can also be there as well. So essentially, my story tonight was to share with you the fact that we've got these incredible resources available now. Get to your question in one second. Okay. Um, and a lot of them are free or incredibly cheap. So you know, talk to your friends, talk to each other. I've shared with you my current favorites. I'm sure new things will be coming out too. But um, we're living in the golden age of amateur astronomy software, and we should just leverage it to the, to the max, because it really does make your life easier. Also makes outreach more fun to be able to help inform people and help them understand what it is they're looking at or what they're seeing. Dan, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to let all the fellow cheapskates out there know <laughs> that uh, Stellarium will also preview the uh, field of view for different frames and lenses and equipment. Nice. It's a powerful program. Free does, especially these days with the, these uh, applications, free does not mean um, not robustly functional <laughs> in any way. Yeah. There, there's a web-based program called Telescopius 
Mm. It'll do much of the same same thing with yeah. your equipment. I've heard of that one. And I've not seen it myself. It's free, but it's not nearly as involved as that, but it's, it's free. Yeah, there's a lot out there. Um, i to check the time real quick. I can take a couple of questions, and then I actually have to run to go pick up my wife from work. But yeah, Jurgen, go ahead. For Sky Safari mm -hmm. Pro, uh, when you pick your um, instruments, is it menu based, or do you have to add? The, do you have to actually put in the details of the item that you it's have? It's both. So it has a huge menu that has a lot of of stuff. But if you don't find yours in there, you can enter uh, the particulars of your unique instrument. Like my Astral 3, uh, 8300 camera, it doesn't have that because that's a really unique camera. So I had to add the information to that one, but it can do that. Do you know if they actually update that list? Because Absolutely. They do. How often do they do it? And I is don't it sneakily know. done in the background? Or? It's done in the background. The okay. one thing that you, have, that you can push to say refresh is the planetary body, planetary object database. So let's say somebody discovers a new comet, and you're like, you know that comet's not in the Sky Safari thing. You update it, it is. Uh, so you can do a manual update, or you can have it set to refresh in some rate for all the, the um, asteroids, comets that are known, and new ones that pop up. Within days, you'd be able to push that button and have that in Sky Safari to be able to plan to observe it or image it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know, for example, Solarium has the ability to show the re how the refractive index of the horizontal yeah. distortions will change the position mm -hmm. of the stars and things. I wanted to advance that into, is there any um, weather type program that show inversion layers visible on the horizon so you get these crazy suns where they're split right. in half or doubled or... There, I, I don't know if any of the planetarium programs do that. I was just reading for the life, and I can't remember what it is, about um, an application, I think an imaging application that does that for you. It, it actually can, can provide information about refractive index and all those things. Um, I don't know if it needs to be connected to the internet to do that. You know, like, so if you're in the field and didn't have an, a connection either through cellular or Wi-Fi, I, I don't know, but I, I was just reading about something that does something like that, and I remember being impressed, <laughs> thinking, wow, that's fancy uh, to be able to do those kinds of calculations. Uh, and again, for planning planning purposes. Yeah, thank you, Jeff, and I, I noticed you your, your computer is just about out of power. Yeah, it wouldn't They're surprise me. It's coming down to 4%. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. I really enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it tonight. Excellent, excellent presentation, Jeff, and I, boy, did I learn a lot. <laughs> I've been using some of the apps you've been using for a while, but I learned a lot tonight, and I hope everyone else did too. Well, all right, well, thank you very much, everyone, and this concludes tonight's meeting of the Madison Astronomical Society, and we look forward to seeing you all here again next month, Friday, October 14th, and have a safe drive home, everyone. Good night. <laughs>